thrilled to have you here, Eddie. Thanks very much. I can see you've got a bit of an intro. Hi, Maddie, folks. So I'm going to leave it <laughs> to you to introduce yourself. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for that. So, yeah, a bit different, possibly, from other seminars that you have. Definitely not in the academic world, practicing academic. No, but I use this slide, have a little box. I never, ever, ever edit a story map of my iPad in Safari before you're doing it, because it kind of went a bit wrong. That box shouldn't be there. But I use this slide when I speak to people down to about 11 years old, so going into schools and saying, no, I'm Michael, but I still think I'm a geographer. Actually, I still think I'm a glaciologist, but we'll get into that. But that's me. Um, you can try and spot me. Uh, I've got the skinniest legs in the lower panel, <laughs> and I'm in the middle of the top photo. But it's also a little picture of my map collection as well. So I do, it, it started early and it's just carried on. There's you know, a lot of sort of maps and visualizing places that you know about in 2D, then your head, and then going out and seeing them in reality and, and, and having those adventures. Because maps are just thousands of adventures waiting to happen. But I suppose this is the next bit of me. Uh, so, background I did my undergrad in Edinburgh. Um, I was so bad at geology, I did geography and geology. Um, that was ideal, it managed to avoid mineralogy and also human geography. <laughs> so it was the perfect combination of two things. Um, but I didn't really get through scratching the itch. Um, so I went off and did a PhD in Swansea a couple of years before Damien arrived there. It's pretty much the same research group, probably. Although my time was a little bit more disjointed because Tavy was in Leeds and I was in Swansea. So, uh, yeah, so I was joint supervised between Swansea and Leeds with Hamish Pritchard, who's now at Bass, doing, still doing some pretty interesting research. But I exited that world and I've worked for a variety of organisations, which I've got on the right hand side of the slide. And I just put numbers on which relate to the months that I've been in each organisation. You can see that some of some of the stays were shorter uh, than others. And I've been with SWE for almost 10 years now, so that needs to go up a little bit. But, uh, but that's who I am. So I've got a, a background in, in glaciology and remote sensing. But this is kind of, if I wasn't doing this stuff, I'd much rather be there riding my bike. Um, but that's the other side of me. Um, but you have to pay the bills and you have to afford the bicycles, so you have to do some sort of physical work. Now, I spoke to Damien, so I've gone a bit deep into, <laughs> into GIS in the future to a point where I'm going to get quite uncomfortable with what I'm saying because I'm not an expert. And he said, oh, there'll be lots of people that aren't necessarily day to day GIS users or, or maybe, maybe want a bit of the background. So I put a video in and I'll play it. So these are these are videos that are often put together to try and explain what's fundamentally quite simple but rapidly gets quite complicated when you start bringing in lots of different data to people that may be making a decision without having been on an MSc or a BSc which covered GIS and actually I think if you go back through the marketing material from Esri and Esri UK we see that we haven't always done that we've kind of dived in with the technical details and then people have glossed over and there's a really good tweet from Ed Parsons already mentioned some people yesterday, he was at uh, an AI conference, and he's like, we need to stop using the term GeoAI to discuss. And he thinks that people just go, yeah, but we're not talking about Geo here, so this is completely irrelevant. So when you, you mention the word G, the GIS or Geo, people go, yeah, but we're talking about data, data integration, system integration, etc. So it's not geography, so we're not going to speak to you. Lo and behold, a lot of their data has a special element to it, and they definitely need some geographical information and some insight to make sense of all that information. But when you lead with the geo, sometimes people just go brown, blow dry, elm patch, and these 
It's not what we're after. But you know that they're going to probably need quite a lot of maps. So Esri, for those you probably all know, founded quite a long time ago by these two people, not Jack, but by Laura and Jack, still privately held, still growing, invests a share of its profits back into R&D and is part of the global network of distributors, of which I am one. So I don't work for Esri the Mothership, I work for Esri UK. We just sell the boxes of software, although we don't ship boxes. We do a lot more than that, but that's a simplification. I thought, it, like, what am I actually going to talk about today was one of the things. I thought, well, actually, universities have multiple faces. They have to address multiple things, and they're different things to different people, depending on uh, what they do. Um, which university is in the photo? Edinburgh. Edinburgh? Yes. Well Obviously, because I am based in Edinburgh, I take pictures of Edinburgh University. So what does the education profile need within a university, but in, within a university, you know, what is the purpose of an academic institution? Well, it's definitely to try and educate students. Well, why are we educating them? Well, probably so as they can get jobs and have careers. And I would say that if you become a 10 year track academic, that's a career. So I love being an academic just into having a successful career. But you have to make employable students. They have to, especially now that they're saddled with so much debt when they come out of their, their their studies, they need to get jobs and start contributing to society so that they can pay off those student loans. And I hope that we create meaningful and fulfilling opportunities for students because that is a an interesting prospect. And if you're interested and you haven't read it before, <coughs> there's another deliberately provocative article from Danny Dorling um, linked there. And there's a news article that came out from it which said junk degrees are soft options if you didn't posh students. Um, actually, the article doesn't say that at all, but the newspaper has decided to cherry pick a flipping comment to start the discussion in the academic paper and report on that. So if you actually read the paper, which is linked there, then you get a very different picture. What he was saying is, if we're talking about sustainability, changing the world for the better, all the way through our studies, why do so many of our students go off to big city corporations and become part of the problem? What are they driven by when they enter that workplace? Because they seem to forget everything that we taught three years ago, five years ago. And that's the real nub of his article. But you know newspapers, they don't necessarily always report. The point, they want to sell newspapers. But on the right hand side is an image from the AGI skills report from 2023, which I don't know if you've read. I've not read it, I've skimmed it. It's always the best thing to do with the GI reports. But <coughs> it was looking at, there was a survey questionnaire which turned out to lots of employers to think about what skills they were looking for and the successful applicants, what skills did they have, which were missing, and which skills were they not really interested in. And it's good news for the MSc students, uh, the data analysis and data processing and data visualization are right at the top of the list. Software engineering. Yeah, and I think the software engineering is a really interesting one. I had a chat with somebody about that, and it's kind of like super niche. But because it's super niche, it's sometimes hard to fill, especially within the geo world, because if you want to make big bucks, you're a software engineer, yeah, don't go geo, because that's not going to get you what you want. So maybe the top talent goes off into these companies in and around Cambridge University um, doing those analytics and various other things. And there's a skills gap there for the, the software engineers within uh, a more geo or a geo focused industry. Soft skills are in there as well, but they're, they're maybe less valued, but we could, we could talk about that data presentation, etc. But I think it's really interesting to report is it's the, the AGI and the Geospatial Commission lesson. I've got opinions on them, which I won't voice necessarily once we've been recorded, but they are trying to gather a body of evidence. What they do with it is what I'm really interested and frustrated by, but at least they've got us some of the metrics where we can then, certainly within the academic space, look at what industry is saying and see if the courses are delivering those skills into the students who then go into their employees. So they are doing something. Right, the next phase of the university is in our research profile. And I think, you know, 
can't fail to notice the problems that we've got, <coughs> both locally, nationally, and internationally, the challenges that we face. Well, the world is dripping in data these days. Um, but data is pretty useless in its raw form. We need to turn it into useful, useful information, which is data science. I think GIS squarely fits within that data science landscape. But you have to be driven by, by research because you have to be interesting to your undergrads. Does that make sense? So you've got, you know that if you've got top flight researchers, university looks good, you've got interesting bright minds, you can deliver that enthusiasm into the undergrad cohort. The, the chances of you just being purely teaching, well, purely research these days in universities is, is pretty small. But um, we should all work together again. The Geospatial Commission has got this report. What they want to do is to try and get a link seems to have come out in the last year at least a better link between uk research institutions central government things like the space catapult um, which is outside oxford and and other things to really see what we can do with geospatial and science and see where we can have measurable impact in central government measurable impact is something that came up over lunch but uh it's something that's a it seems to be one of the metrics that the funding councils are using. So if you can't demonstrate who's going to benefit, how they're going to benefit, why they're going to benefit, at the time, the timely fashion, then you probably won't get your funding at the moment. And it's really difficult to come up with those, uh, those metrics for success, unless you've got the contacts into the organisations that are going to directly benefit. <coughs> and I think there's things that organisations like Esri can do when you think that we work with lots of central government agencies and we work with universities, often we can just be still a black for the young people uh, a bit of dating where we just do the introduction and then we step back and our technology will be used in some cases but may not be but often it's just connecting people that can be most useful and there's definitely an industry requirement and that harps back to that geospatial um, element but Lejo is going to kick me because I've got state and facilities to a face but I can talk about it here but the industry requirement, you know, industry is looking for solutions and it's looking for talent and knowledge and skills coming out of the university sector. And good universities will be not one step ahead as I've got there, but recognizing the opportunities that are emerging. So at the moment, AI is a buzzword, we'll come to that later, but students that have an appreciation of deep learning within geospatial will be able to sell themselves to innovative organisations in the industry sector. So universities that have got an eye on industry and a deep intrinsic link with university, uh, sorry, industry, uh, will do well. And your alumni network, you know, Damien brings people along to the SRE UK conference and there's a lot of alumni that come there. But your network will expand. You need to keep hold of all of those good students that go off into places. You keep finding out what they want, what their organisations need, and then looking at what you're delivering into your teaching. Don't have a slide on the states, but you know that's the other side of what university has to do. It's part of your student satisfaction and staff satisfaction that you get to work in quite a nice place. You've got a lovely campus. It's very leafy. Uh, it's got some good new buildings. It's got some older buildings with old building issues, but they look nice. And you know the Wi-Fi should work, etc. Um, but the estates and facilities team have to try and keep everybody happy, uh, probably with smaller and smaller budgets, um, not something you have to do. So what does the university sector really have to do? Well, it's about striving and balance, isn't it? It's just kind of a bit of a Venn diagram that really doesn't mean very much into this, and uh, not just to get a Venn diagram in, but I think you've got education, research and industry, and where there's overlap, um, interesting things can happen. I don't, I don't know what I could have put in for education and industry beyond a guest lecture, but you could get partnerships on research and research collaboration. So, you know, working with telecoms company or, you know, you've got water companies on your campus, they've got really interesting things that you can do with sensor networks into drains, which can then feed research and science, which then innovates and leans their processes or is early intervention to problems, which might be to do with their network or they might be epidemiological with what well, we've all had COVID uh, over the last five years, but you know, dipping a drain downstream of a student campus for sexually transmitted diseases happens, but it could be automated. 
So you get an early intervention to a problem that's happening in your student homes. And where you've got these links, I think there's interesting science that, that is there to be done. Right. <coughs> What's changed? Well, I thought I really want to talk about what might happen in the next five years. <coughs> but before I got there, I thought I'd reflect on actually how far we've come. And this is sort of interesting because a lot has changed in just the last five years. Obviously, this image is Arc IMS. Hands up if you've ever had to use Arc IMS. No, okay, so it's only me that needs therapy. It, it's awful. <laughs> it was utterly awful. I remember the job that I was doing, and you get given the handbook. It's like, right, stand up an Arc IMS instance on the server. Here's the handbook. And if, if anybody got through all of the instructions and got the hollow world on the web server at the end, which means success, first time, then they got a round of applause in the office. But I didn't see any rounds of applause in five years that I was in the office because everybody failed. It was awful. Um, but what's really changed is the accessibility of the technology GIS. And I'm not talking about just an every flavor of technology here. I'm just talking that when you break accessibility down into the cost, its ease of use, its utility, its scalability. All got easier. And that means that the opportunities have got larger. So that the opportunities for the students coming out of those skills have got greater and greater and greater. But the hardware costs alone, so this is an ESRI estimate, guesstimate of costs. But in the old days, to do any proper big GIS, you were talking about having an enterprise deployment, so a server, so you'd have to buy the server, and then you'd have to maintain the server, so that's your staff costs. I have no idea what staff costs could be, so I left it blank. About 50 to 100k for the hardware, 40 or 50k for the software. So even before you then have a human being to maintain and install the server, you're well over 100k just to do some big GIS. And as our computers have got faster and our software has got better, you just need a desktop. So ArcMap, bless it, as it goes into, <laughs> into final retirement uh, this year. Uh, long overdue. With some great memes online uh, about the death of ArcMap. But you just needed a good laptop, which would be 1 or 2k. The software at full commercial costs would be 2 or 5k, depending on what you did. And you don't need a human being, you don't need a dedicated server support person to help you with your desktop. You're just there installing the software. There's no other costs. So you're down to about 5k probably. And then as we move into software as a service online, um, it just comes down again. So the access in terms of cost for any organization has come down as the utility goes up, as the amount of data that we're collecting goes up. It's also a lot easier because I, I can no longer set up ArcGIS Enterprise. I have no idea if I get any to do it. Much easier. ArcGIS Online is super simple. It has a map when you open it. Revolutionary, because ArcMap doesn't, QGIS doesn't. So when you open up a GIS software, the first thing you have to do is work out how to get a map onto it. You're like, oh, I thought there would be a map in here that I could use. It's just not much easier. And I do take this for granted. Like I said, this isn't really a sales pitch, but I take ArcGIS Online for granted. I remember the first time I saw ArcGIS online, I was at a JISRA conference, and my predecessor, Angela Baker, who was the higher education manager back then, had a you know, bright, shiny, young grad demoing this system. And I was with Bruce Gittings from University of Edinburgh, sat next to me, and I was working for Adina. I was doing Digimap service delivery. And he leant over and said, that's Digimap fucked. <laughs> Said I wouldn't swear, I've broken that already. Yeah. But I remember that, and it kind of stuck in my head. And this job wasn't, this job came up maybe two years later. And, I, and you know, Digimap is not F. It's a great service which supplies that OS data into the hands of novice users so that you can just get on and use it. What they do is fantastic. But this is great, it just connects you to so much data, some lightweight analysis tools, it just takes the pain out of GIS. The baby steps. <coughs> And you do take it for granted, or certainly I do. Over the last five years, we've had this little road bump to navigate, and it changed everything. So it changed the way that I work. I definitely got my work-life balance completely wrong pre-COVID. I was on the road all the time. People 
who demand meetings in London and you'd have to go to London for an hour. And then they'd say, well, I've only got 30 minutes. And you're like, fantastic. But now, you know, Teams has, has evolved and we're much happier doing video conferencing and we can get better balance in our life, but it disrupted the hell out of everything. And you all in academia had more disruption than most. I remember our sales director going, well, at least the university sector is okay. I'm like, you are joking. Like they rely on foreign students and they're not coming from China. But they are going to be financially strapped from this um, for the next couple of years. But the way that you responded agilely to ensure that the learners got your expert knowledge in the best possible way that you could deliver it with the constraints that you were facing. It's fantastic. So I've watched one of Damien's video uh, where he was in his garage surrounded by bikes, canoes, various bits of outdoor equipment, um, sat there explaining how to uh, look at different Landsat images over a flood basin or a migrating river channel to his undergrads. I'm putting it up on YouTube so that they could access it and then he had a link and it was great, you know. But you don't do that now. That was definitely a sticky plaster to get you through the problem that you were facing at the time. But there were certain things that we should definitely keep going forward. And I put in here a little John Hopkins dashboard, which is now dead. It got switched off. Um, did anybody have a look at this? So somebody in a video recently said that it had been watched by, and I think they said like four billion people. And you know when you go, what? No. So I put a billion uh, brackets by somebody's estimates. I don't know. But it, it, the, the, the amount of hits and views that the site has had is by far and away the most viewed bit of ArcGIS on the planet, if not GIS, by non-expert users. My dad can use it. He can navigate this dashboard and get some usable information. Now he is a retired GP, so he understands different interventions in different geographical regions, but he can't break it. My God, he can break IT equipment. So it's really good, but it was an elegant demonstration of how you take complex data, simplify it, make it accessible and usable by non-expert users, which is what we often do in the GIS world. Also, little known fact, there was a grad student that came up with the idea. It wasn't the professor of epidemiology at John Hopkins University. They got on board later and they improved version one to whatever version uh, we see now. But the best idea came from a grad student who'd had a little bit of training, knew where the data was, went looking for it, and just had just enough GIS and a lightweight tool to pull it in and go, oh, look what I made. And they're like, what have you made? Please show us. We can improve this. This is great, but let's, let's make it better. So it's often humbling to remember that the best ideas can come from anywhere. So what are we doing to try and change that landscape that, that, that we are in, that GIS landscape? So we've been working for a while to give free GIS into schools. Now, we've got this very yellow site, uh, which actually tries to give teachers the support. If you think about, like, schools are not properly funded in the UK. And I could talk for ages and complain about that. But teachers just need good resources to teach geography. Geography, if you've noticed in the news this week, is dying on its arse in Scotland. Uh, the number of PGDE students is down by, I think, 50% again this year. So next year, there will only be something like 23 new geography teachers trained across the of Scotland. If you think about how many are retiring, it means that some schools won't have a geography teacher at all. So geography will be taught in first and second year by a history, modern studies, or RE teacher. So what hope do the kids have of being enthused by geography to end up in an institution like this studying geography, environmental science, GIS work? I think it's terrible. So we're trying to support them by giving them the resources at their fingertips. But when you go out and try and train PGD teachers, and you ask them about their GIS experience to date, you get this. So we collect this from every single PGD engagement that we do. We teach probably 90% of all geography teachers <coughs> going through in the UK each year. We do a hands-on session of at least an hour with them. And that's what comes back. 
What's your experience of GIS at university? Frustrating, challenging, lacking, confusing. Okay, now the question before this is, what technology did you use? And most of it is ARC, so a lot of it is our fault. But why is it like that? Well, that's how it was. This is how, this is the most, one of the more recent word clouds. And you can see that there's a glimmer of hope sort of sneaking in. That there's now, there's still stressful, hard, long, complex, tedious, but there's good, fun, enriching, useful once mustard. Everything's useful once mustard. Uh, except maybe TikTok. But uh, yeah. <laughs> but there's a glimmer of hope. And I think, I've forgotten to put it on. Is it back here? We've got a couple of grads now that when we do sort of the entry uh, interview with them into Esri UK, when, when the education team is older and try to send them back to the universities and schools, we ask them where they first used GIS, they say in school. And what was it? It was like ArcGIS Online, where it was our app that the teacher had put together, and it was really good. It was looking at earthquakes, it was looking at volcanoes, it was looking at sustainable development goals and a story. But well, their first interaction was in school, and it was positive. And I think that's a huge change. It's, it's for Katie and Dave, this is like brilliant, and Jason as well, who's been working on it for years. It, it's really encouraging that teachers are getting to grips with GIS, that they're comfortable to use it and confident enough to stand up in front of 30, 13 year old boys. Because, my God, using ArcMap in that environment would be petrified. 13 year old boys and Katie are the worst. Uh, the worst. Not mine, but I can quite believe it. So, where are we going? Um, well, you might be asking, where's it going with the presentation? It's been rambling, and it will be. It is a bit, it, I do feel like it is a bit of a ramble. What's my brain thinking about? Before we go into this, I will put a disclaimer that I asked some clever people about this, and these are the answers that they gave me, and my knowledge runs out. My head hurt considerably having had 20 minutes with our former CTO talking about AI, where I was like, Charles, just stop. I've got notes and notes and notes, but also a headache. Uh, but he's a fantastic brain. If you ever get to spend some time with Charles, can do take the opportunity. But I think imagery is definitely something that is going to be increasingly important uh, across the GI sector, certainly within Esri, it will be super important. It will be something that we'll be pushing quite hard because most people assume ArcGIS is a vector first application, and if you want to do some raster stuff, get yourself a remote sensing package. And I am guilty of doing that. I was an NV user for years, it's great. Erdas, imagine, and things like that. That's no longer the case. There's a very strong raster engine within ArcGIS. Why do I tell you this? Because Actually, you know, weaving, it's not just about vector, it's vector and raster. Actually, we, we have so many satellites collecting data. Most of the data that we collect, I think, is raster these days, rather than, than point data that lines with polygon. Um, so we have to make use of it. You know, we've got, we've got some uh, un unfamiliar faces in the back. They're a, they're a, a company uh, that fly drones and collect predominantly raster data. Now, You'll know that once you've got your raster data, you can you can extract vectors from it. You can extract points, lines, and polygons from it. But it starts out as the raster data. And when we think about why these things are changing, well, there's lots of reasons. So my PhD was meant to be using INSAR data, but it didn't work. So I had to go to archived aerial imagery from the 1930s forward. Um, and people said, ah, oh, it's really disappointing, Addy, because like, you're going to really struggle to get any job with photogrammetry because photogrammetry is a dying art. <laughs> and they were right, because LIDAR was, was on the ascendancy. And certainly within the academic space, like the projects after me, uh, Nick Barrent, who's now at Birmingham, he was using LIDAR because he got the funding from NERC to have LIDAR on a plane. I think somebody had kicked, like, but we kicked a LiDAR sensor into the back of the NERC plane the year I wanted it and it had broken, so I didn't get to fly LiDAR data. But photogrammetry was dying. But it isn't that new, because we've got access to drones. So we've got cheaper sensors, smaller sensors, flying much closer to the thing that we're sensing. So we have lots of data. Photogrammetry has come back up. I've forgotten all of my photogrammetry, so I'm still not employed. 
but we've got more data, more open data, critically, more satellites, multiple sensors, drones, drones, and uh, cloud compute. Like, don't underestimate the relevance of the cloud compute in this equation, because when you've got lots and lots of data, you're going to have to do something with it, and the best one in the world, your laptop might not be the thing to use, and then you can just spin up a virtual machine and push all of the data from the cloud <coughs> Just pay for it whilst you need it. Cloud compute is transforming. <coughs> Think about what we can do in the scale of the problems that we actually have. And then I've got this just to give me another chance to have a drink. But what this is is a scene in ArcGIS Online. I think it's downstream from a roller uh, because I've called it that. Um, I think I've got the data from somebody at Worcester. And it's nice because you've got our, our base map data, the standard imagery from RGIS online, and then you've got some higher res imagery showing sort of high energy um, river environment. And it's not hard to process this stuff and then make it performant in a browser. <coughs> make it available for other people who are not experts. And it's got even better because these little things have got even more powerful. So this one doesn't have a LiDAR sensor, but this one does. And if I'd actually read the spec, I would have got the Wi-Fi enabled. The, the network enabled one, the one with the SIM card, because that doesn't have a GPS in it. Kicking myself. Uh, forget the wrong one. So I could do LiDAR scans with this, but then I have to spoof uh, GPS signal usually through my phone to try and get them to, to OK, and it's never as good as we can be. But the fact that we have tiny little LiDARs in our very expensive phones is amazing. But what opportunity does that give you within education? So here we've got something from a colleague, Jason, who got one of these phones and thought, I'm going to go and use it. And he went down to the funny thing is, he went down on a lovely day and then he went out with his phone and he started filming the rocks and then people started telling him to F off because everybody was on the beach in their swimwear and he was the only weirdo trying to capture some LiDAR data at that moment in time. And he was like, top tip, Addy, if you're going to go and get this data on the beach, pick a cloudy day, otherwise you might well get your teeth knocked. And he is not the person to pick a fight with, though, and he's quite big. But here's the scan that he got from his iPhone. And it's just a set of dipping beds or a wave cut platform, but it's neat. It's, it's got some educational value, especially when you can't get to the field all the time. Now, going out and showing the students how to collect the data is, is a very good thing. I, I, like I would say you have to maintain as much field work as you can within education. But what can you do with this stuff when you come back? Can you then use that uh, for the next set people going into the field to one, familiarise them with the field, two, get them thinking about the environment, three, get them asking some questions, four, focus them on what they're going to go and investigate. So not a replacement for the field or a field trip, but something to uh, augment or um, familiarise. Right, okay, now we're getting into the unsettling bit for me. So AI, you can't do <coughs> a talk looking at what might happen in the next five years without having something on AI. And the geo sector is going to be impacted by, by AI. And I think that everybody, everybody will have their own opinion in this room, and I'm sure some of you will be excited by AI, and I think some of you will be apprehensive, and some of you might be <coughs> really not all that comfortable with some of the predictions for AI. I started reading this book on holiday. I had to stop reading this book on holiday because it was ruining my holiday. Now, I think it ends okay. I think he gets to the point where he's like, it's going to be okay, but we need to be careful and we need regulation and we need AI for good because there will still be some bad people. Um, but I had to stop. It was just too stressful on my holiday. But what is AI? And I kind of, I've struggled a little bit in really getting to grips with what AI is, because certainly within Esri, people were going, well, we've got AI in the platform, we've got this and this. It's like, it's just stuff that we've been doing for years that you've been banished. Is that what it is? 
Well, then surely it's something bigger, and then you've got large language models and various other bits. Um, but I spoke to one person, and while Charles was talking about um, AI, and then John um, Gregson, who's another colleague, when the problem that I've got with AI is that it shouldn't be called artificial intelligence, it should just be called algorithms in sight, because that's all it is. AI is just an algorithm. Think of it as an algorithm. Think of it as an algorithm which is looking backwards at a body of training data and it's trying to predict something before you do it. That's AI. It's an algorithm. It's just an algorithm. Idea. I was like, oh, actually, I'll write that down because that sounds quite cool, but it linked back to what Charles was saying. But I think when you get to the bottom of AI is just algorithms doing things. We've had algorithms for years, but these ones are getting clever and they are able to look at such a large amount of data now that they are able to pretty accurately predict what you want to type. But who remembers that little paper clip? The word. <laughs> I mean, a, a rudimentary form of AI, but it just knew where people were going to get tripped up. And it could see what people were doing, and it could learn what they're probably going to do next. Ding, ding, ding. Do you need a little bit of help there? You're like, no, go away. I got it. But it was kind of doing what many of the AIs are actually trying to do. But yeah, so this is really saying that you know, within geospatial, we've been doing rudimentary AI without calling it AI for quite a long time. And I'd say that the geospatial industry is pretty poor at blowing its own trumpet at times. And then data science comes along. It's like, oh, data science, we can solve everything. And you're looking at it going, well, you've misunderstood the geography. So, okay, and like, well, you're not doing it. It's like, well, we were, but we just weren't shouting as loudly. And it's not as cool and sexy. Um, see comments about brown corduroy, <coughs> but that's often the problem, isn't it? It's, a, it's about how. I mean, how do you how do you tempt students onto courses? It has to look interesting. It has to look like it's got a good career path, and then you're competing against things like data science. So Liverpool has a data science NSC, and it does a hell of a lot of GIS, but they haven't called it GIS. They've called it data science. Whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, I'm not too sure. But we're trying as an organization to make deep learning, machine learning, and AI more accessible to more users by publishing libraries and module models that people can just pick up and then they can integrate into their workflows. You still have to train them. You have to work out if they're going to do a good job, but then you can unleash them. You don't have to write the code. You can look at it, you can look at what it's doing, but you don't have to write it. And there's over a hundred of them in the Living Atlas. And you know, your students can use them. We were talking earlier about whether or not you can take CCTV cameras and then look at the number of cars and car parks every half an hour for an entire year. You know what it's possible because you've got the data and you've got the models, and you've probably got cloud computing access to do it. But these models are probably the starting point. Because there's one here called car detection. And I believe the cars in the USA are pretty similar to the ones here, so it should be okay. Some of them definitely have that regional element where, where applying them globally would be difficult because they're focused on training data from certain geographical regions where cars are. And it comes down to, to this as well, where we're thinking about data, data collection and how you can improve the accuracy of data um, as it's being collected. So this is like Survey123, which is a really simple field data collection app, but you can bake an image recognition tool into it. So it's when you take a picture, it automatically assigns it one of these two values, a speed sign or a stop sign. The user doesn't then have to fill that in. So the next level is that you just have an automated process where the user doesn't have to start the point. It's just doing it in real time, maybe with a camera on a bus, moving around the city, taking pictures and mapping the things. What can you do? So it's all possible. It's probably possible by your MSc students, but probably some of the undergrad students as well who get into it. <coughs> so where can AI have an impact for us in geo? Well, I think we can break it into two different parts. And I think AI really has utility as a co-pilot for how we work, as well as a tool to develop GI capabilities. Now, the previous two slides were really about the GI capabilities, I suppose. And I put in, I didn't have a slide for this this morning, so I took a risk. I went back onto an iPad in Safari and tried to edit my story map, and it worked. 
but it's the, the, the standard Gartner hype curve. Um, and I don't really have anything to say about it, except it's quite interesting to look at these and then maybe look at them from a couple of years ago and see where things are moving in the estimates, because they've got that time period to get to uh, the plateau. And usually the time periods that we predict are overestimates. The stuff comes to fruition a lot quicker than we would think. You know, there's, there's, it's like a threshold is reached in any system. And then starts running away. And maybe we, we had all of that hype around AI last year, and maybe that was one of the thresholds and things have calmed down, but I'm sure we'll get another leap forward. So what do I mean by a co-pilot? Well, as we started been working on, on ways, thinking back to that paper clip, how can how can we help users? So there's a really good video, um, which I think is that geo AI resource. Um, which is a video by Andy Turner, who's one of the guys out of the States who's really looking at GeoAI, and it's a conference presentation. And if you think about it, we've got this living atlas, and the way that, that uh, ArcGIS Online works, you know, you can put in supermarkets, which I did in my little rotating video I had earlier, and then you put in IMD, and the data comes in. So why not have a text box saying, what is the average IMD score for all of the supermarkets in Devon? And it just pulls back an answer automatically. So under the hood, it's taking that question, I'm going to find the data for you automatically from the system, from a human readable statement, rather than loading data and going to tools and running them. And that's really where I think AI as a co-pilot comes in. So it's like a large language model for a, for, with, with knowledge of geospatial tools and data and the currency of that data automatically pulling up. In the video that I do, and I have no idea if it is a working beta or a whole load of smoke and mirrors at the moment, but if it is smoke and mirrors at the moment, it won't be in six months or four months time. You'll probably see it at the UC as well in July. But I think it's really interesting to think about that. And what does that give us as an opportunity? Okay, it could be really scary because you go, oh my God, all these GIS jobs are going to disappear because any Muppet can just type stuff in and then get a map. Where's it? We're going to get rid of ourselves and make ourselves redundant. Probably not. But it does allow people to query data through natural language, I suppose. Does that make sense? I think there's a huge opportunity with that, especially if you start putting some of your research data in. Now, the entire thing is based on the sexiest of subjects, which is metadata, um, because you can't have that natural language model hooking into the correct data unless you've got really good metadata. Metadata being one of the most dull things to enter about your data. But if you're going to have a machine query that data, you're going to have to have really good metadata about why it was collected, when it was collected, what the fields in there, what you can do with it. So as the computer can then go, that looks like the right one, I'll bring that back, and then I'll intersect it with you know, the most recent county boundaries, you know, also like an average, and now we know that Tesco seem to be in an IMD decile of four, but Marks and Spencer seem to be in an IMD decile of like four. Does that also then make GIS more accessible to non-GI users? Yes, because the hardest thing in GIS, in my opinion, is knowing where to look to get the answer to the question that you've got. We rely on quite technical, technical language to describe our tools. And if you don't know the difference between two tools and why you should use them in different applications, there's a good chance that your analysis won't really be as uh, sound as it could be. <coughs> but the computer would know. And we'd maybe do a better job. And you know, this is an image, where is it off? Frankfurt, I think. Um, but it's about that translating risk to normal, non technical people in the way that they might actually <coughs> take this and understand what might happen to them. And I've got digital twins in here as well, because if you think about the algorithm comment, algorithms inside, you've got digital twins. We've got lots of digital twins. Great. 
a digital twin of this building. Fantastic. How does it interact with like, the sewage drain network? What? No idea. So there's a digital twin for that. So I think AI will also come in where you've got multiple digital twins, which <coughs> are based on data schemas, but you need them to interact and they'll have to be, it's almost like that middleware to connect them and to translate in real time because our, we want our digital twins to be responding to in, in as real time as possible. How do you do that translation from data schemes? So as you can then link them and get the useful and usable information about the impact of this building on a network or the impact of that network on this building. <coughs> so when I spoke to Charles about that, I think he said something like the OS are spending loads of money on AI. But I don't think anything is going to come of it quite yet. They're interesting projects, but they haven't really found this thing that's going to really transform their business. <coughs> start to my voice a little bit. But they're using one of our tools called Suite, which allows them to do real-time topographical edits of their, their core data with multiple people. So think of it as a Google Doc or a Word Doc where multiple people are editing it at the same time. But there's rules, okay? So Damien has mandated that the document's going to be in Arial and Arial only, and then you try and put it into Calibri and you can't. That's a rule that Damien has instigated in the data model of the Word document and you can't break it. But he's forgotten to change the font size and set the rule. So David does it in font size six. He's that kind of person. You're not, obviously. But, um, so Sweet uses these, these rules so as any of the editors can upload their data and maintain their core data set in the background in real time. It used to take months and months and months of that survey data to get into their core database. What I think will be really cool is when we've got live data coming from all the sensors. So maybe you've got LiDAR, you've got point clouds, or you've got um, automated cameras picking up things on the network. Like on roads. How can that feed into systems of record like the, the uh, ordnance survey are maintaining? Well, it will be able to do it, but it'll probably have to use AI to extract the features. So think about a point cloud being huge and massive. How can we extract usable and useful information out of that very automatically? It'll be AI. How can you then feed it into a system of record without absolutely banjaxing that system of record up so it's unusable? Rules based on algorithms also. And Charles was like, he thinks that's the key to AI in our sector at the moment is to have automated data collection and a rules based data model and AI helping smash it in without. <coughs> So we're not quite there yet, but, um, but that's where he sees the opportunity. I don't know if the National Mapping Agency quite share his vision yet, but he's a bright guy, he's much brighter than me, and that's what he told me was probably the most exciting thing in his world. But what of your world? So, AI and education. Well, I didn't know much about this, so I asked an AI, didn't I? I said, what are the opportunities for the use of AI in education? And it came back with this list, personalised learning, automated grading and feedback, well, that'd be scary, wouldn't it? Uh, virtual tutors, data-driven insight, that would be great. Enhanced accessibility, automated administrative tasks, well, that'd be good, I wish it had been. But these are the things that are things there is an opportunity. And I really do think there is an opportunity for you to, to harness some AI. But obviously, you're going to say, well, there's a lot of risks here, Eddie. Well, I asked. Now, it's interesting that the numbers don't quite work. One, two, three, four, two, three. <laughs> but uh, we'll gloss over that. Um, it's interesting that it's a much shorter list, isn't it? Is the AI bigging itself up rather than doing itself down? But I think the risks, I can't go. I don't think teacher displacement at the moment is a real concern. I, I don't think you would trust AI all that much. Certainly when I've used it, it's been credible, credible, credible. I'm going to check this. And then you start really 
digging into the details, and you're like, you fucking made this up. So there's a point at which, you know, it's, it's user beware with AI at the moment. Uh, certainly, this is from large language models I'm talking about. Um, does that make sense? I think there are opportunities and risks. I don't really want to go into all of them, but I don't think it's all doom and gloom with AI that you'll all be redundant and actually will make GIS so easy that there's no GIS experts, you don't need GIS education. I don't think that's where we're heading. We're heading to a point that we can tackle bigger problems closer to real time to have a benefit to environment and society. Because we've got sensors, cloud compute, deep learning and AI. That's where I think the excitement is. But if you are going to do stuff, who's heard of the Lucas Charter? No? Anyone? Oh, there might be something useful for you out of this presentation. After all, not a wasting hour. So I'd recommend having a look at it. And it's really talking not about AI, just the general use of geospatial data and the responsibilities that should come with that. And the Locust Charter is a, it's a group of individuals who represent organisations that got together to write the Ten Commandments um, of what you shouldn't do or think about when you're working with geographic data because it can often identify individuals. And if you're doing that, don't be that guy. It's many guys. But uh, prevent identification of individuals is number nine. This is a really good thing to also pass to your students because they are going to end up in organisations. Not all of them will be ethically driven. Yeah. But they're quite nice. And here's a little example. So there's, a, there's a link to this. Um, <coughs> but this is San Francisco. And this is driving under the influence data, I think. DOI, DUI. I'll do my alphabet, do you want? Um, and that's the data. So there's spikes where there's more uh, problems. So the higher the spike, the bigger the problem. So you get this topography. So it's a, it's a really nice visualization to go, oh, you can clear it. See, there's some problems up here, and there's a line, so there's definitely a trend. I'm sorry if there's Americans, bad Americans. So. The person thought, great, I've made a really good visualization of this complex data which tells people where there are problems. Well, the problem is, that's not really the truth. Because the information was already, the, the location was degraded. Um, and it was actually aggregated to, to almost like a, like a data zone in America or a zip code boundary. Uh, so it had already been averaged to that. So it was now represented as a polygon, but reported as a point. And the point was at the center of the polygon. And then the spikes appear at the center of the polygon as well. So you've gone from a cluster of points to an average for a polygon represented by a point. So then the average user goes, flipping hell, what are they getting up there? It's flipping loads. That could be quite a big area, which has now been represented as a single peak on the map. And the blog goes into more details about the other things that the cartographer, the decisions that they made, that then uh, caused problems with visualization and probably some problems for the people that lived in the areas that are, that are quite bumpy. But it was it wasn't done with malice. It was just done because they didn't really understand how the data had already been degraded and anonymized. But their visualization didn't tell the story of the data in the first place. You can get the same effect from the police data in the UK. So what does good look like? I'm coming to the end here, which I'm going to rapidly go through. Well, teaching GIS in university is about starting simply and building complexity. That's, that's what you should do with all teaching, not just GIS. You start with the simple stuff, you make it engaging, <coughs> students get into it, and you slowly, like boiling a frog, you ramp up the complexity. Uh, and they keep with you. Some will drop off. But those that drop off have had an okay experience up to that point and they've learned some skills. If you start with the hard stuff, people drop out and they're left with nothing. And because we've got things like RGIS online, easy doesn't mean desktop, QGIS or ArcGIS. 
So lots of universities are making good progress in making GIS more accessible and easier for getting more students to be data literate, which is good because the landscape of employment requires that uh, data literacy. And Exeter is a good organization which has been having this sort of like simplified approach for quite a number of years, which has manifested itself into, you know, a joint honours with, is it geography with GIS as a specialism and now the MSc in GIS. Uh, these are some of the, the really great grants that came along to our conference and then stood up in front of them their peers and some of the alumni gave really good, insightful presentations on their undergrad projects, was it? It was a like group exercise. Yeah. So I think, you know, that this path is not by accident and it's been determined by, by key people that are driving that simplification to get the students to understand that we live in a data-rich world. We're surrounded by problems, but there's usually data to describe those problems, and there's tools to understand that data to try and come up with solutions. And that's a quote from our head of talent, Laura, who, who messaged me and said, what the hell is going on with Exeter? And I was like, what do you mean? And it's like, well, we could have filled the entire grants scheme, this is sort of seven or eight people, with their students this year. My retort was, well, why didn't you? Uh, because I think they're good. But you know, our, our HR team, when I arrived, we're like, right, so the good universities are Edinburgh, Oxford, Cambridge, UCL, Imperial. Full stop. I'm like, rubbish. It's UWE, it's Exeter, Dundee. Like, they're all doing really good teaching. I'm like, well, they're not on our list. And it's like, well, they should be. Just because you're at the top of the Russell Group doesn't mean that you're doing the best job teaching. And Exeter is doing a pretty good job. Right, done.